we thank God for God is not done with us yet. It is such a pleasure, privilege, and joy to be here at the St. Mark's Church yet again. I don't feel like a guest or a visitor. I feel like family. Uh, John has already shared with you this is my third time uh, being here on, on, with you for this series. Uh, it's a joy and pleasure. I call it my St. Mark's Sunday. Uh, it's always the last Sunday of July to come and hang out with you guys, and so I'm thankful. You all have one of the best uh, gifted and nicest persons as a pastor in the whole wide world, and that is Pete. Can we thank God for Pete in his absence today? Uh, Pete is my friend. He's my brother from another mother, and I'm grateful to the staff who has been so gracious and kind to me all week long from the podcast to uh, this morning, I've, I've been given coffee and uh, they just asked me a few minutes ago, were well, they getting on my nerves about the microphone? I said, no, I'm glad. They're just, everybody just so nice around here. Uh, even the police officer was nice to me this morning, amen. <laughs> so that was, that was great, I was glad, glad to be here. Um, to, to Phil Bowers, who is with us today. That is my brother from another mother. You couldn't tell us that we're not related. Um, he has been so gracious. Our East Burlington uh, campus is, is combined and in partnership with Sustainable Alamance, and so he's such a great, great guy. To the leadership and laity of the Elon First Baptist Church, now, some of them are here but didn't tell me they were coming. They're not supposed to be here. They're still supposed to be at Elon. <laughs> uh, and so they, they snuck over here and didn't tell me, but I'm certainly grateful for, for those who are with us and all our staff who have come along. Uh, you know, Pete does this thing where he asked me to, to always start the storytelling series. Uh, I always think it's unfair that I, I have to be the one to start the series. And so um, I hold that vendetta in my heart against him because um, um, it's like if I mess up, um, you know, I, I, I started the series and messed it up, so he puts all the pressure on me. But, but today, uh, when, when Pete and I were talking about the storytelling series, he, last year was about hospitality. Um, and then, um, but this year, I, I like how he themed it for impact, right? And so that's what we want to talk about today. Now, I want to tell you up front, I don't preach as long as Pete does. That's the running joke. I promise to get you out 20 minutes earlier. <laughs> okay? <laughs> promise to get you out 20 minutes earlier. Um, uh, when I first started coming around, Pete told me that he preached for like 50 minutes. I was like, man, ain't no way. If I preached 50 minutes in my church, they would have walked out in minute 32. <laughs> <laughs> so today I want to call your attention to John chapter 11. This is a familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. I'm going to read 17 through 21. You know, you all know me. I walk around, I talk, I laugh, I joke. Um, that's just who I am. And so uh, let's, let's have a good time to get together this morning. Here it is. John eleven seventeen through 21. The New Revised Standard Version says, And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. Many other Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. But when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is one of my favorite stories. John Levin is probably one of my favorite gospel text. In fact, when I was at Wake Forest Divinity School in Winston-Salem, I wrote my New Testament paper on John 11. It's, it's really my favorite. So I want to give you a spoiler alert early. John 11 says Lazarus dies and he's resurrected. Glory to God. I know, that's what most people preach about when they talk about John 11. They rush to the fact that Lazarus is sick, he dies, Jesus gets to the tomb and resurrects Lazarus from the dead. Well, that's not what I want to preach about today. I don't really want to deal with the resurrection of Lazarus. In fact, I'd rather deal with these two sisters, Mary and, and Martha. 
Because impact is so interesting to me in that while we talk about impact and impacting others' lives, I think that there's a part of impact that we also miss. Here's what we miss is who impacts the person who impacts everybody else? That's what I want to talk to you today about. See, we could talk about Lazarus being resurrected and all is fine, but let's really talk about Mary and Martha. Jesus is their friend. Every time Jesus comes to Bethany, he finds himself at Mary and Martha's house. In fact, every time he comes to, Bethany's, to Bethany, he gets a meal that Martha prepares and a bedding. He gets lodging. They're friends. And in their friendship, you would think that if anybody needed him the most and quickly he would get up and go to them but he doesn't now for those of you who are going to call me sacrilegious this morning I'm going to tell you up front that Mr. Jesus in John 11 does some things that are very hurtful let's talk about it Lazarus is sick, and it's not like he's only been sick for two days. Lazarus has been sick for a while. But Mary and Martha find themselves caring for their brother, taking care of their brother, loving their brother, and then what happens? He gets to the point where no medicine can fix it, no doctor can cure it, Now they say, we need Jesus. It's not as if Jesus had known that his friend was sick, because he knew that his friend was sick. Here's the problem. is that when they finally reached out to Jesus and said, hey, man. I don't know if they called him, they texted him, they DM'd him. I don't know how they got to him, but he got word that he's sick. Jesus tells the disciples Lazarus is sick, but he stays where he was for two more days. Now, if you're my friend, wouldn't you get up when I need you? (laughs) Wouldn't you leave from where you are at my time of crisis to somewhat find out what's going on? Obviously, I've called you because I need you, and yet Jesus didn't come. The Bible says he stays where he was two more days. By the time he gets up from where he is to go and find Mary and Martha, Lazarus is dead. Can I add insult to injury? So not only does Jesus stay where he is two more days, let me tell you what really frustrates me. He goes around Bethany, makes a pit stop. The disciples say, why are you here? They don't even like you. He looks at them and says, I need to go through here, and then goes to Bethany. Now, let me explain what I mean. Most of us know where Mebane is. Of course, we know where Burlington is because we're here. So if we're coming from Wissett, and I say I need to go to Burlington, Why would I go from Wissett to Mebbin to Burlington? That don't make sense. And the way gas prices are, that really don't make sense. (laughs) Well, that's what Jesus does. He, He literally goes around Bethany just to find himself back in Bethany. And by the time he shows up, Lazarus is dead four days. Here's my frustration, though. The frustration is, it's not as if Mary and Martha didn't know who Jesus was. That's the reason why they called him. It wasn't the fact that they hadn't seen him work miracles. That's why they called him. They seen him open blinded eyes. They seen him open deaf ears. 
They've seen him when a woman was bleeding for 12 years, touched the H-E-M and was healed. The woman who was bent over for 18 years and he healed her. Jairus' daughter who was dead, he didn't even have to go to the house. He sent a word and the baby was healed. Now tell me, how frustrating can it be? That I feed you, I give you somewhere to stay, and you still don't show up for me. By this time that he's in Bethany, he shows up like that friend of ours. All of us have that friend or that family member that is always late. But when they show up, it's like the party can start now. <laughs> So he shows up in Bethany and is like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> and they're, they're like, yeah, but we called you four days ago. We called you when there was still life left in Lazarus and you didn't come. We called you when we needed you the most and now there's nothing that can be done. We called you when we knew you could have laid your hands and spoke a word and he be healed. But nothing changed. You stayed where you were. Jesus, fashionably late with his 12 disciples, his entourage, shows up with a smile on his face. I finally made it to Bethany. Mary and Martha are at home sitting around the table, Jews, their friends, are sitting around the table with them, probably somewhat trying to encourage them or being nosy. Because y'all know we all have those friends that when something happened, they want to know what happened, where they were, who was it. So here they are, right, sitting at the table. And Martha and Mary hear that Jesus is in Bethany, and guess what they do? Martha gets up from the table and Mary says, I ain't going to see him. Now, I know some of y'all look at me like I'm crazy this morning. But the truth of the matter is, Mary said, there's no need for me to go see him because when I called him, he didn't show up. So why would I go see him now? She had no intentions of going to see Mr. Jesus. Martha did. Martha finds where Jesus is. And when she gets there, Martha says to Jesus, not, hey, how you doing? Not, it's good to see you. Martha says, dude, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus says back to her, oh, but he'll rise again. How beautiful is that? He'll rise again. And then Martha has to do what so many of us do. She has to use theology and Bible and cliches to make it sound good. Oh, he will. In that great resurrection. And Jesus says, but if only you would believe, you'll see the glory of God. Martha runs to Jesus. Mary stays at the table. And I want to suggest this morning that most of us will either identify with Martha or Mary. The tension of our lives is calling on a Savior that sometimes doesn't show up when we need him to. Here, these two sisters have spent the majority of their life impacting somebody else. Let's talk about it. Not only have they fed and clothed Jesus, they've served their community. And then they've served their brother. And watch this. Here they are, after serving their brother, impacting his life, he's dead. So Martha runs to Jesus, tries to tell him off. She leaves from Jesus to go back home to tell Mary 
But here's what's interesting. Jesus and Martha knew Mary had no intentions of going to see him. Because watch what Martha says to him. To her. Martha says, the teacher is here. And I can see Mary saying, I know, that's why you went to go see him. <laughs> and then Mary says, so what? And Martha says, and he wants to see you. Hmm. She has to get up from her comfortable chair and go see a man that she's been frustrated with. I want to ask you a question that I asked on the podcast the other day. Who makes the clown laugh? Because the clown's job is to make everybody else laugh. But who makes the one who makes everybody else laugh, laugh? So the question this morning is who impacts the person's life that spends their time impacting everybody else's life? See, Mary and Martha have spent their time impacting everybody else's life. And now these two sisters are left on empty. See, I, I somewhat thought that the story had so much to do with the resurrection of Lazarus that I overlooked the fact that this is the first time that they've had to sit with their reality of not serving anybody. Jesus ain't there. Lazarus is dead. And now the Jews have come to comfort them, which means it's the first time that they've had to sit with a reality that I'm on empty. Because, see, Martha represents work. Martha's been so busy doing work <laughs> that she's had no time to sit with the fact that as much as I've given to everybody else, Nobody has given to me. As much as I've impacted other people's lives, nobody's impacted me. As much as I've filled other people's cup, nobody's filled mine. So this sermon this morning is, may not be for everybody. But this sermon this morning is for people who've had to live your, your life impacting everybody else. And for the first time in a long time, now you sit in a sad reality that while you've poured everybody else's cup up, nobody's poured into yours. I know we want to rush to Lazarus. I know we want to talk about that he got up. No, 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 no. Let's talk about Mary and Martha. Because that's what we are, impacting the world and nobody's impacting us. Filling people's cup up and nobody's pouring back into ours. Do you know how difficult it is? Some of you got up this morning, you put a smile on your face, you put your nice clothes on, you put your makeup on, whatever. Came to church, you stopped by star. Um, Ooh. Ooh. See, I said Starbucks. See, that's why y'all know. If y'all went to Starbucks this morning, the Lord's not pleased. You're supposed to go to St. Mark's Coffee Shop. See? <laughs> Stopped by the coffee shop this morning. You got your coffee. You walked in. You spoke to everybody. Hey, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Smile, 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 smile. But on the inside, you've learned how to fake your way through it. Smile your way through it. But on the inside, you're empty because you've been giving to everybody and nobody seems to give to you. So Mary says, I don't want to see him. <laughs> and Martha says, the teacher wants to see you. 
So Mary gets up, leaves from home, decides to go find where Jesus is. And when she gets to Mr. Jesus, Mary does something that blesses my life. The Bible says that she falls down and weeps. Now, she doesn't fall down and worship. Because this is the same Mary in John 11 that weeps at his feet, but in John 12 will worship at his feet. And it, and it blesses me because I want to see Mary in my mind feel fall down and worship. But the Bible doesn't say she worships. It only says that she weeps in John 11. Which means that by this time, Mary is in tune with what she feels. And some of us are too busy trying to be like Martha. See, Martha wasn't trying to be in tune with what she felt. Martha was trying to put some Bible on it, some some scripture on it, some cliche to make it feel better. But when Mary shows up, she says, I don't have the answers to feel better. All I know is that here I am on empty. And somebody this morning is like, Pastor, Pastor Wilkes, uh, tell, tell me, tell, tell me what's the significance of, of Mary just weeping at his feet? Well, the significance is that while the story changes in John 12, that Lazarus is actually sitting at the table and everything is fine, and she worships at his feet, Jesus never changed who Jesus was. In John 12, Jesus could take the fact that Mary was worshiping at his feet, but in John 11, Jesus could handle the fact that she was weeping at his feet because God can handle whether you weep or you worship. God can handle whether you're happy or you're sad. God God can handle whether you're up or you're down. And that's what I want to tell somebody this morning. God is not angry with you because you're weeping. God is not angry with you because you're sad. God can handle both. There's sometimes that you find yourself on empty and you have nothing left to give. And here it is. God can handle whether you worship or you weep. So here it is. Mary says, Mary says to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And all along, this is the first time that Mary and Martha have been able to actually figure out what in the world is going on with me. Can I tell y'all something my seminary professor told me? What well, the Vinny School professor told me at Wake Forest, um, in a moment of transparency, I am not a vulnerable individual. I'm only vulnerable with people I trust, and I don't trust everybody. Just being truthful, I don't trust everybody. So mostly people only get, hey, good to see you. God bless you. Hope you're doing well, you know. And if they ask me how I'm doing, I'm doing good. I don't usually open up to people. So I'm sitting in class, right, and um, again, I'm not vulnerable. And we're in this spirituality of the Enneagram class, and it was the best yet worst class of my whole divinity school. I would have rather learned about Martin Luther and church history in the 1500s than have to sit in this class. And I'll tell you why. Because I had to be open and vulnerable with people I didn't know. So in the spirituality of the Enneagram class, and we're sitting around, and, and they, they did these God-awful panels, right? And so the panels were like two and three people. And the professor of the class, Dr. Chris Copeland, would just, I mean, drill questions to you about your personality type. And I told him, I said, Chris, this is the most uncomfortable class I've ever taken in my life. You know, can you hurry up, please? Or go to somebody else. Stop asking me questions. So he says, well, I don't want to ask you anything. I want to tell you a problem. Now, if you don't know me, you know, to tell me my problem. <laughs> That's, that's rough, you know. Those are like, so I'm from Gastonia, North Carolina. Um, there's, a, there's another side of me to tell me my problem. 
So I was like, oh, okay, you're going to tell me my problem. So you tell me mine, then I'm going to tell you yours. <laughs> so he says, James, you know your problem? I said, what is my problem? He said, you don't know how to be, B-E. So I said, Chris, that sounds so great, but I don't understand that. He says, you don't know how to be still. Because busyness covers what you feel. And Martha and Mary have been so busy that they don't even know what they really feel. And that's the reason Lazarus dies. You know why? Not just so we can have a resurrection, so they can have a moment to figure out that they're on empty. If I looked at your calendar today, I bet your calendar is full. We stack our meetings back to back, back to back, back to back, back to back. Because when we have to sit with our thoughts about our life, it hurts. So we cover it up. Some of y'all are introverts, and when, when, when you know you're getting ready to sit with your feelings, you'll even go out with a whole group of people. <laughs> we don't like to sit with our feelings. So for two days, Jesus deliberately didn't show up and made Mary and Martha sit with the fact that they've been giving to everybody else, and now they're on empty. Whew. Can I tell you something that one of my members told me? Well, not just one, several have told me in the last two days. <laughs> Slow down. Some of us are moving too fast. We're doing too much. And it's because we're trying to cover up the fact that we're on empty. I'm almost done. Mary and Martha find themselves on empty. Jesus shows up. Martha tries to work her way through it. Mary weeps her way through it. And Jesus cries at the tomb. I don't want to say that Jesus cries at the tomb because Lazarus is dead. I don't even want to say Jesus cries at the tomb because the disciples didn't believe. I really want to say he cried because somewhat he was in tune with his humanity. And he felt the emptiness of his friends. Can I give y'all some good information this morning? It matters who you let pour into you. Because everybody can't. I'm going to bless y'all this morning. Mary and Martha have been sitting at the table with Jews for two or three days. And they still on empty. Which means that the friends that were sitting at the table didn't have the, cap the capabilities to pour into them. It matters who you let pour into you. So pastor, help me this morning. Okay, I am. I got a tea time, so... I won't hold you long. That's the joy y'all get from me that I won't preach long during the summertime because I play golf on Sundays. Praise God. <laughs> Pastor, help me. What do I do? Because I'm on empty. And I'm at my wit's end. And I don't know what's going to happen. Well, Martha and Mary show us what to do. I just told you. They went to their teacher and their friend. Because they had dual relationship. Jesus was both friend and teacher. Jesus was both friend and savior, right? They went to their friend, but they left with their savior. But can I tell you where, where they found to be filled again? Was not on the mountaintop. They found filling at his feet. Pastor, I need some help. 
because I'm on empty. I'm impacting the world and yet I don't feel I'm being impacted. Can I tell you where to come? To his feet. Come, weary one, come to his feet. Come, broken hearted one, come to his feet. Come, empty one, come to his feet. Jesus is willing and able to fill you if you come to his feet. You, you, you know what really gets me though? Is that Jesus doesn't fill them when Lazarus is resurrected. <laughs> he, he fills them before the resurrection ever takes place. You know why? Because sometimes our story won't change till later. But what God will do is he doesn't necessarily have to change our story. He can just fill us before he changes our story. He will fill us and give us strength for today to be able to face tomorrow. And I don't know who needs to hear me this morning, but I want you to know that if you come to his feet, Things may not change tomorrow, but he'll give you strength to endure today and walk through tomorrow. So come to his feet. Weary one, come. Come to his feet, empty one. Come. He's willing. <laughs> He's able. To fill you again. So who impacts the one who impacts everybody else? Jesus does. I know what it feels like to be empty. I know what it feels like not to have anything left to give. But I also know what it feels like fall at his feet it was at his feet that I found joy again it was at his feet that I found hope again it was at his feet that I found peace again it was at his feet that I found love again and I don't know who you are but come to his feet he's still a way out of no way. Come to his feet. He's still Alpha and Omega. Come to his feet and he's waiting on you with his arms wide open. It doesn't matter if you're angry or you're sad. It doesn't matter if you're happy. It doesn't matter if you're mad. It doesn't matter if you're weeping. It doesn't matter if you're worshiping. Just make your way to his feet. And when you get there, Maybe you're like Mary, you don't have words to say. Sometimes when I'm on empty, and I find myself at his feet, I don't have words to say. But I believe somehow that the tears that roll down my face are words that only Jesus can understand. Come, weary one, come. Even with no words, just come to his feet. Hey, maybe it's that day where you're like, I actually have something to say. Come to his feet. Tell him I'm empty. I told the earlier crowd today, I, in a moment of transparency, I know what it feels like to be on empty. I know what it feels like to be frustrated with a Jesus that you wish would have shown up. Four years ago, I lost my father. I'm very transparent about it now. I'm my only child. I lost my mother when I was two, and my father died when I was 26. He died unexpectedly. We had spent Tuesday through Friday together. We'd enjoyed one another. He 
hugged me, told me he loved me, he'd see me soon. We talked Monday, didn't talk Tuesday. Tuesday night I got to call at 1017 and he died. For two years, I preached about a God I was frustrated with. I preached about a Jesus that I believed in, but a Jesus that I couldn't figure out for two years. And I remember the Sunday that I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm empty. I don't want to live like this anymore. And that Sunday, in high charismatic worship, was a Sunday that I kneeled down at my chair. And I remember the words of Jesus saying to me these words, Son, <laughs> I've been waiting on you to come at my feet. It was in that moment, not that my life story changed about my father, but it was at that moment that I realized that if I just come to his feet, he may not change the world, but he can give me strength. So you, my brother, you, my sister, whatever you're carrying, whatever you have on your shoulder, come to his feet. The same Jesus that waited on me is the same Jesus that's waiting on you. Come, weary one, come. Come, empty one, come. Come, lonely one, come. Let him fill you again. God, we thank you. Because we too have been Martha and Mary we've tried to work our way through some stuff and it didn't work we tried to sit our way out of some stuff and it still didn't work but thank you that you remind us that all we have to do is come to your feet with the burdens of our life and the burdens on our shoulders that you're waiting with your arms wide open and that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So give us strength to come to your feet and remind us that while things may not change, that you'll give us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. We love you. We honor you. And we adore you. It's in Jesus' name. Everyone shout amen. amen. Hug somebody around you and tell them God's waiting on you.